The story of Jean-Baptiste is one of Utah's most intriguing, mainly due to the gruesome topic and that there is very little known historically about the grave robber himself. Long ago, his ghost was said to walk the shores of the Great Salt Lake, and this was further supported, in a way, when a couple of hunters found a skull near the mouth of the Jordan River in 1890, and further still when a partial skeleton missing its head, but with a ball and chain attached to its leg, in 1893. The people were certain that Jean-Baptiste had indeed been found, and his fate was known at last. But was it? Let's take a look at the story of Jean-Baptiste and his dastardly deeds. It all began with the death of a man named Moroni Clausen. On January 17, 1862, Moroni Clausen and another man who were accused of beating then-Governor John Dawson were shot and killed by Salt Lake City Police. When no one came forward to give Moroni a proper burial, the county paid for the burial and a police officer named Henry Heath purchased Clausen's burial suit out of his own pocket. Heath was later quoted as saying, I don't believe any pauper had better or cleaner clothing than he. Eventually, the Clausen family heard that Moroni had been killed and buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. They asked to exhume his body so that they could bury it in their family plot in Draper, Utah. When they opened the pine box, Moroni's brother George was horrified to find that not only had Moroni's body been placed face first in the casket, but it was also completely naked. Henry later ran into George, who was incensed over the way his brother's body had been treated. Henry immediately knew that there must be some misunderstanding. Talk was spreading around Salt Lake City, and city officials were determined to get to the bottom of it. Henry, along with three or four other men, went to the house of the sexton, J.C. Little, and asked him how he thought Moroni's body came to be divested of its clothing and upside down. Little was just as shocked as they were and joined the men as they went to the house of the grave digger, Jean Baptiste. We get some of our best information about Baptiste from Henry himself. He told reporters that Baptiste was a Frenchman and had come to Utah by way of Australia. At the time that this occurred, Baptiste was living in a house on 3rd Street between P and R. When the men arrived at Baptiste's home, they found only his wife was there. They entered the house and began talking to Mrs. Baptiste, who they described as, quote, a very simple-minded woman. As the men stood around talking, they couldn't help but notice numerous boxes of clothing that they had the curiosity to examine. Heath would go on to state that the men were absolutely horrified when they realized that the clothing contained in these boxes were the, quote, funeral robes of people who had been buried in the city cemetery for several years past. Heath said he became enraged because just nine months earlier, he had buried his beloved daughter Sarah in the city cemetery and was afraid that her grave had been robbed. I should add that the clothing was described as, quote, a motley, sickening heap of flesh-soiled linen. The men then left Baptiste's house and headed to the cemetery where they found Baptiste digging away on a new grave. Heath would later say he had half the mind to strangle Baptiste right then and there. Heath immediately accused Baptiste of robbing graves and said that Baptiste fell to his knees, calling God to witness that he was innocent. Heath was quoted as saying, I choked the wretch into a confession when he begged for his life as a human being never pled before. Dragging Baptiste to a grave, he demanded to know if it had been robbed. Baptiste answered yes. Heath then pointed to his daughter's grave and asked if that one had been robbed. Baptiste's response was, no, no, not that one, not that one. News of the confrontation and confession spread around town like wildfire, and Heath had much difficulty in getting Baptiste to the jail safely. When Baptiste was arrested, he was wearing a broadcloth Prince Albert suit in which a saloon keeper named Carpenter had been buried in some time previously. Over the next three weeks, Heath helped take care of Baptiste in jail. The city took all of the boxes of moldering clothing from the Baptiste house and spread them out in the county courthouse for families to come through and identify clothing which belonged to their deceased loved ones. The clothing was set on a broad 50-foot table which was covered in several hundred funeral suits, from babies to the elderly. Another man, Albert Dewey, corroborated Heath's account of the incident and added that not only was Baptiste hoarding the clothing of the dead for some unknown reason, but he would also use their caskets as firewood. Dewey described Baptiste as, quote, 
the most singular human being I have ever known in my life. He appeared to be entirely conscienceless. He hoarded the clothes of the dead about his premises as a miser would his gold. It is not true that he sold his plunder to second-hand dealers. He seldom disposed of any and kept careful watch over all his ill-gotten gains. He had no fear of the dead, though he greatly feared death himself. Robbing the dead was a mania with him, and he made it his business. Brigham Young spoke about Baptiste's crime on February 9, 1862. He is quoted as saying, To hang a man for such a deed would not begin to satisfy my feelings. What shall we do with him? Shoot him? No, that would do no good to anybody but himself. Would you imprison him during life? That would do nobody any good. What I would do with him came to me quickly after I heard of the circumstances. This I will mention before I make other remarks. If it was left to me, I would make him a fugitive and vagabond upon the earth. Young would also go on to tell people that they don't need to worry about digging up their dead and reburying them in clothing. He also mentioned that people were reporting having had strange dreams and hearing rapping on the door, headboard, floor, table, etc. The people imagined these were their deceased relatives who were upset that their graves had been robbed. Young stated, quote, My dead friends have not been to me to tell me that they were naked, cold, etc. And if any such wrappings should come to me, I should tell them to go to their own place. The clothing was later reburied in a single grave in the city cemetery. Dewey stated that the authorities realized turning Baptiste loose in town was an immediate death sentence for him. So to, quote, give him a chance for his life, it was decided that he would be banished to a well-stocked island in the Great Salt Lake. Prior to being taken to the island, he stated he was tattooed, not branded, with indelible ink that read, branded for robbing the dead across his forehead. He was taken to what is now Fremont Island by brothers who kept cattle there. Loaded in a wagon and covered with a blanket, he was first taken to Antelope Island. From there, he was put on a boat and taken to Fremont. Both Dewey and Heath emphatically stated that when let loose on the island, Baptiste was not shackled and was not attached to a ball and chain. Fremont Island was chosen because the water surrounding it was deeper, and wading to shore, they said, would have been impossible. Also, the brothers who kept cattle on the island would make frequent trips there to check their stock, and the island already had a shanty and provisions. Approximately three weeks after Baptiste had been left on the island, the brothers returned and saw Baptiste had helped himself to their provisions and seemed to be, quote, getting along very well. Three weeks after that, the brothers again returned and discovered that Baptiste was nowhere to be found. They found the roof and parts of the sides of the cabin were gone, and part of the carcass of a three-year-old heifer was lying on the ground a short distance away, and portions of the hide had been ripped into thongs. It was evident to the men that with tools found in the cabin, Baptiste had fashioned himself a raft and made his escape. Heath believed that Baptiste set off for the northern or western shore of the lake. While he wouldn't say whether or not he believed Baptiste made it to shore successfully, he was certain that the skeleton found did not belong to Baptiste. Most people in the years immediately following the Baptiste incident did not believe that he died in the lake. Most believe he headed north towards Promontory Point. A few years following his escape, authorities in Salt Lake received word from an unquestioned authority that Baptiste was seen in a mining camp in Montana and once questioned, confessed to being Jean Baptiste. I've spent years trying to track Baptiste's activity prior to arriving in Utah. It is true that he was living in the gold fields of Castlemaine, Australia, and working as a miner. How he ended up in Australia, however, is unknown. Because of Australia's criminal beginnings, I suspect he might have been sent there due to crimes he committed. I can't imagine one goes from law-abiding citizen to preeminent grave robber overnight. He was also apparently on a quest to find religion. He would later tell missionaries he was raised Catholic, tried out the Church of England, as well as the Methodist Church, but wasn't satisfied with any of them. He met up with some Mormon missionaries and quickly joined their cause. He went so far as to donate a chapel he had built for them to use. He also lived in a small portion of the building. It would later come to light while confessing to his crimes in Salt Lake that he had been robbing the dead while in Australia, and there's a really good chance the chapel was built partially out of coffin wood. 
In April 1855, Baptiste, along with 71 other new converts to the LDS faith, boarded the doomed ship Tarquinia, headed for the United States. By July 5th, the ship reached Hawaii after almost sinking and was eventually condemned. As wily as Baptiste was, however, he eventually had enough money to make it to San Francisco by February of 1856. In 1858, he moved to Salt Lake City, and by 1859, he was busy robbing graves. In 1860, Baptiste listed his age as 47 and his occupation as a common laborer. That would make his year of birth around 1814. He was said to have been born in Venice, Italy, but would list his place of birth as Ireland on the census. And that brings us to the end of the story of Jean Baptiste, the grave robber of Salt Lake City. Let me know in the comments below if you think Baptiste made it ashore. Thank you for watching, and if you like this video, please make sure to like and subscribe. As always, I'm Jennifer Jones. See you next time.